Wonderful. Good morning, everyone, and I hope you uh, got some rest yesterday. And um, it's a pleasure to begin our full day of Jerry Fest, as we are affectionately calling it. Uh, this morning, we will begin with uh, a welcome uh, from Professor Artie Rye. Uh, who is um, a chaired professor at Duke Law School. Um, you all know her. She is no stranger to this community. Um, and um, her center is, of course, co-sponsoring um, the Jerry Fest. Um, and so welcome, Professor Artie Wright. So welcome everyone to the second day and the first full day. I'm delighted to be here to honor my colleague of 15 years, Professor Jerry Reichman. Regrettably, I couldn't be here yesterday, but I understand that all went smoothly and well, and we had some terrific talks on several of Jerry's many passions, including the economics of innovation and trade and competition law. As if that weren't enough, we're going to do even more today with a series of wide-ranging panels, which will touch, obviously, on those issues of innovation and competition and trade, but will also d drill down on some more specifics. So again, this is all testimony to Jerry's extremely wide-ranging scholarship. I think that it's fair to say that there are very few people in legal academia who have ranged as widely as Jerry has. And it's, it's been just such a pleasure to, to know him for all of these many years. So today we will talk about overlapping and hybrid intellectual property rights, one of Jerry's passions, and I will be on that panel together with others. We will have a panel on data and the digital commons. We'll have a panel on non-voluntary licensing of pharmaceutical patents, a subject that Jerry has been extremely passionate about for many, many years. Relatedly, a panel on trips and developing countries, and then we'll conclude with yet another one of Jerry's favorite topics, uh, which I think every time I see Jerry, somehow it comes up, and that's the choice between property rules and liability rules. No matter what one is talking to Jerry about, somehow that will come up. And um, it, uh, it, it's, it's, it's terrific that we'll have that as the closing panel. Also terrific that we'll hear from the Honorable Guido Calabresi, who of course has a little something to say about property and liability rules, and maybe he will touch on that as well. So as I said, I've been a colleague of Jerry's for 15 years, and as a consequence, perhaps inevitably have had the pleasure of working with him on a, several articles, at least three by my count. One on using, guess what, liability rules to <laughs> incentivize pooling of molecule trade secrets, um, molecules that are held as trade secrets by multiple pharmaceutical firms, so as to promote a better and faster and cheaper innovation in pharmaceuticals, a, a theme I think that we'll touch upon a lot today. A second, um, Again, showing how widely Jerry ranges, we did a, a second article on domestic and international strategies to on the supply side. Um, so you know we don't have a carbon tax, regrettably. So um, we have to think about supply str uh, strategies for promoting green innovation. And Jerry and I um, and several others did a paper on that. And uh, I tried to get some of that through um, the Obama administration in my time there, but. Um, and, and actually, some of some of the suggestions were taken up. Um, and then finally, a third uh, paper with several uh, of the folks in the audience here, including Jerry, on Baidol and developing countries. So it's been a truly delightful experience to work with Jerry in general, and then specifically on those papers. Probably my favorite was the first one on trade secret pooling, which was a long several year process and all of the writing, um, Paul Euler was also involved with that paper, um, all of the writing was done truly collectively. We didn't split up the paper at all, which meant that all of the writing was done at Jerry's house over the course of many, many, many weekends. Um, and <laughs> I can say that that was the most enjoyable writing process I've ever had because we were constantly being plied with food and drink. Um, generally speaking, when I write, I'm in my cold office and maybe I'll get a cup of cold coffee, but 
it, it, with Jerry, we had the, the best coffee, the best wine. You know, it was, it was just astounding. Um, and I wish we could do it again, but, you know, we will see. What has really struck me through all of this collaborative work is Jerry's desire and ability to think through problems from the ground up and from the perspective of all the relevant stakeholders. I think yesterday, Jer uh, Terry, excuse me, mentioned the connection of Jerry's scholarship with legal realism. And I, I, my, my strong sense is Jerry is very much a realist in the best sense of the word, in the sense that he really understands institutions and political economy, but without cynicism, or excessive cynicism at least, and he tries to let, leverage that understanding to promote the themes of this conference, innovation and justice in a globalized world. Um, and I think that that's a, a really hard trick to pull off to be really um, sophisticated about the relevant institutions and the relevant political economy, but nonetheless um, not become cynical and be very passionate about trying to promote goals of innovation and justice. Jerry is also, as we all know, very adept at thinking about another central challenge of our field, which is how to fit new technologies into existing boxes. We all know Jerry's legendary work with Pam and others on software, which continues to be extremely useful um, for my thinking today, as well as his work, um, and I, I see that this is on one of the bags that's being distributed, the work on appropriate protection of that very interesting and novel technology of green tulips. <laughs> so, more, but more generally, um, the how to protect subpatentable innovation um, and how to think about different ways of moving outside the traditional boxes of patents and copyrights and trademarks and trade secrets. So you'll hear me, from me again in a moment, so I'm gonna shut up um, because the next panel will involve my sounding some of the same themes I just um, sounded um, and I will talk in particular about the ways in which Jerry has really inspired me to think about sequential and cumulative innovation in areas like biology and software, um, because I think together with Suzanne Scotchmer and others, um, uh, Jerry has been one of the leading thinkers on sequential and cumulative innovation. And uh, excuse me, um, I couldn't have done what I my thinking without his standing on the sh his giant shoulders. So let me introduce the moderator for the next panel. Um, I think he's here. Um, Professor Peter, another giant, uh, Professor Peter Jazzy, who is a professor emeritus at American University Law School. He teaches and writes in the areas of copyright law in historical and cultural contexts. He was a founder of Americans Glasgow Samuelson Intellectual Property Law Clinic and its program on intellectual property. He's had many, many illustrious um, positions in institutions like the Copyright Society and um, as uh, on committees with the Librarian of Congress. He's got a classic book on copyright called Reclaiming Copyright that was just reissued in um, 2018 by the University of Chicago Press. And in 2007, Professor Jazzy uh, received the American Library Association's Ray Peterson Copyright Award. So welcome. As you all are getting seated, uh, Christine, Dan, Daniel, Bassem, Artie, and, and Marquetta, I'll just say a word or two first of thanks to the organizers, to Ruth and, of course, Lauren for all of her help, to Justin for his enormous labors and his mastery of the arts of secrecy, and to, to Irene, in, in, in Irene's case, a special thanks for allowing me to take over the panel that she had originally been scheduled to moderate. And that's meaningful to me because I said last night that, that I fell in love with Jerry before I knew Jerry when I first read 
footnote 288 of the <laughs> Applied Scientific Knowledge article. But I kind of lied, or maybe oversimplified. Actually, the, this, this, this passion, this love interest, began earlier than that when I was trying desperately to understand the set of issues that we in the United States seem to persist, however quaintly, in referring to as the problem of useful articles. And it was then that I encountered the Duke article and the Copyright Society article. I said last night that footnote 288 and the article in which it's embedded was, is a magisterial production. So I, am look, I, had, I worked overnight to come up with another adjective to describe those two articles. I came up with monumental. Uh, they're sort of two great, two great peaks of scholarship. And that not only introduced me to this extraordinary mind and its workings, but it also piqued in me a, what has been a career-long interest in this problem, the puzzle, as our panel designation calls it, of hybrids and overlaps of, of clashes and collisions between different forms of intellectual property and, I would add, of the spaces in between. Because one of the things that Jerry's scholarship in this area over years, beginning but never ending, around this topic has demonstrated to us is the importance of the spaces in between, the ways in which the so-called gaps in IP protection may actually be features rather than bugs in our system. So with that, no more. I'm also not even going to attempt to do introductions of this extraordinarily distinguished panel. It's just to say that I'm delighted that you're here. And Asha, you're up. I've got a two minute sign that I'll flash after 10. No problem. Here it is. Here. Need a timer. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, Ruth, Irene, and Justin, for uh, inviting me to the to Jerry Fest and for the excellent organization leading to this event. Uh, I will start first. Before, first of all, I allowed myself to use the badge and the logo that we received yesterday on my presentation. <laughs> uh, so hopefully you will accept that, Jerry. Uh, before I start my presentation, uh, much has been said yesterday about your kindness, generosity, valuable contribution to the academic uh, debates. I wanted today to uh, share with you some insights about the value of your work in the Global South when I started 15, 20 years ago uh, teaching IP. And I was always facing the challenge. Students coming from developing countries do not believe in the value of the intellectual property. It's a system for the rich, and there is no place for the poor. And I was always relying on some of your work to push back the disruptive uh, justice as Terry uh, summarized yesterday, and I was assigning some of your articles, uh, not only on the trips, but uh, the role of developing countries into the IP system in general. So you have been, without seeing you, in my uh, teaching for years, Fast forward in 2007, uh, I got the pleasure to meet you in person for the first time when I established with my colleague, uh, Toby Moody, the uh, traditional knowledge expert group in Canada to work on how to foster innovation while respecting the indigenous uh, knowledge. And I have to say, your contribution with Ruth, Margot, Graham was uh, very generous, very interesting insights that we have seen. As you are doing today, you are taking notes and providing insights all over the meetings. And we had meetings for two days, nonstop, and you are not bored. You are always generous in providing ideas. So I want to thank you from this place for all the work that you have been doing. 
Moving fast, fast, fast forward, uh, I will be focusing today on the puzzle, uh, puzzle of IP rights in the era of AI and disruptive technology. We have seen the accelerated progress of technology uh, and the interdisciplinary characteristics among sectors and industry have laid the foundation of a potential game changing in intellectual property norms from autonomous cars to artificial uh, intelligence creating music or arts to IBM Watson, uh, healthcare machines that can be designed in one country, uh, trained in a second country by data coming from a third country. We have seen IP getting up in most of the discussion that we have seen, and we have seen the trend from the agriculture revolution towards the data knowledge economy and the 2016 uh, 2017 we have seen the big changes of the uh, companies leading uh, based on their intangible assets that has led to challenges that we are familiar with with the intellectual property for years but the challenge became more and more complex. How they became more and more complex, we started to see very interesting examples, and Martin can help me in the pronunciation a little bit, with the uh, Rembrandt uh, piece of art in 2016, that we have seen a collaboration between museums and research institutions in the Netherlands, in conjunction with Microsoft, to uh, built the next Rembrandt based on the famous artwork. How it happens that we got a new uh, painting built on uh, work that computer was uh, fed with several works, uh, hundreds of artworks by the, the Dutch Golden Age artist and the machine using certain algorithms have produced a portrait based on the style and motif found in the Rembrandt art. We are not talking about direct relation between programmer and machine. We are talking about machine absorbing the information and then producing a piece of art. My second example, the wave net project that initially was created uh, for the seamless artificial voice audio and ended after providing the machine with different pieces by creating music that is totally different. So with those new challenges, we started to think about legal personality that we are familiar with. We started to think about who owns uh, the rights over uh, the, the, uh, the work that we are seeing. Does the painting have copyright on its own? Uh, who owns it? And whether the, the, what would it be? A copyright infringement uh, using the different pieces leading to the work that we are having? Several questions that we started to see recently and we are always asked and faced what the role of IP rights. We started to apply the logic that we are familiar with, the non-human copyright is not accepted and we started to think beside that whether we need uh, uh, sui generis rights Shall we follow a UK approach and think about uh, AI assisted work protection? Or shall we start thinking about electronic person that might be included in our copyright system? And here I'm confirming that we are not talking about the machine aided works. It's very simple when we have the direct relation 
to find some answers and some models that has been applied. The UK approach in this area, the person by whom the arrangement necessary for the creation for the work are undertaken will be having the right over that. We have, been, so we have seen several implication and application for that. The guidance, again, was some of the work that Jerry and Pam did on the software long time ago that can be applied. The challenge that we are facing now, the ownership or the authorship for the machine-generated works. Uh, the general rule that we are familiar with, that creative works uh, uh, by AI machines are not copyrightable because they do not satisfy the human author requirement. Non-humans are not natural person and may not held legally responsible in a court of law. However, there is a pressure, pressure coming from the tech industry, how we can protect the investment conducted in this area, what rules can be applied. And we have seen confirmation that there is no protection. Uh, some scholars started to rely on the work of higher doctrine, uh, the relation between employer and employee to justify the uh, protection. Uh, if a work is made of or hire an employer is considered the author, even if an employee actually created the work. The employer can be a firm, can be an organization, can be an individual. However, we are looking for a relative interpretation for the word employer that can be considered uh, in this area, the owner of programmer employ the service of the AI service, uh, device in order to generate the new creative works. Those are parts of some of the discussion within the uh, doctrine regarding the uh, work of hire. Uh, however, we still have some challenges regulated to whether it will be the programmer, the institution, or the users, the end users of the AI in this area. Another option that has been uh, used, uh, the sweet generous rights for a limited period of time, protecting uh, the output created by AI, similar to what we have in the EU database rights which aim uh, to protect investment. Certain arguments have been advanced to protect AI based or to build a sui generis system to protect AI. However, we have several questions that has been raised and associated. What can be the originality of the work in those cases? How, what would be the criteria for originality in those cases? The EU originality crea uh, criteria require the work of the author own intellectual creation. We are talking about own intellectual creation and personal touch. Within the US, we are talking about provided that the work was created by a human being. Are we going to leave the work in the public domain do we need to revise our concepts to include the lack of, person of uh, personality? And my second question, what would be the moral rights in this case? Is it possible to attribute a moral right, uh, attribution, integrity for the machine? Those are some of the questions that I have been working on, trying to provide some answers. Uh, I will move uh, forward to the uh, exception and limitation, uh, the fair use, fair dealing, debate. I believe that might be one of the areas that we will rely a lot on the fair use and we can see it in the coming few years as an international standard that can be used for the uh, AI machines to protect, uh, to be used as an exception 
uh, to limit the right uh, the rights of uh, the copyrights. My second point that I want to focus on is the tax and data mining. We had some discussion uh, earlier how we can use the text and data mining and whether it can be useful for uh, research. It has been used uh, recently by several countries, the UK, Germany, Estonia. They have a specific exception for text and data mining. Japan, they had two amendments to their Copyright Act to include uh, a large text and data mining supporting the development of uh, or the innovation system in Japan. However, the debate whether we want to limit this uh, TDM or we want to expand it, shall, we, shall it include, uh, shall, I, can see, I can see the sign. <laughs> so I will try to wrap up very quickly. Uh, shall it be included for commercial, non-commercial uh, research? several questions that have been uh, raised and we are following now the implementation of those rules in the countries who adapted the uh, TDM. My last point regarding the collective license and I was wondering what we have seen within the music industries, the restaurant playing music against a certain fees, can we apply that for the machines? Can we apply the same system by uh, paying a similar uh, fee to make use of the copyrighted work to train the machines. My last slide is the famous intellectual property metro map prepared by the European Union. Are we still talking about the same map? Do we need to adjust the main station that we have here? The main uh, rights or steps that we need to evaluate each of the intellectual property rights. This is a question that I'm uh, raising, not only for Jerry, but for all of us to think about how we can move forward with the um, uh, disruptive technology. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good. Thank you for bearing with me. Uh, good morning. Um, I want to follow others and um, thank our gracious hosts and organizers. Um, I think this is a really special event, and I want to thank you for all the care that you put into organizing it, and uh, so impressive that somebody could organize, well, a group of talented people could organize not only an amazing conference, but have it be a secret. That's really a, a feat. Um, and I am so honored um, to be among the people honoring Jerry. Uh, that really is a special, a special uh, thing, and I, and I feel very uh, privileged to be amongst all of you. Um, I, you know, many people have talked about Jerry's generosity, um, and I just want to emphasize one aspect of that. Um, what I love about Jerry, what I think is so special about Jerry, is the way he acts so enthusiastically about all the information that comes to him. You know, to see him at a conference, he is almost sitting on the edge of a seat, right? He, it's, it's as if every person who's presenting something is writing on the very topic that he happens to have just written about that morning. You know, he's just so uh, ravenous for it. So it's, it's a delight. And, it's, and what could be more encouraging than that? So um, thank you, Jared. Uh, so I have a current um, project in design, um, and I wanted to take the opportunity to talk about Jerry's work on design, uh, which Peter, you kind of beat me to yesterday and mentioned um, a little bit in his talk. Um, chronologically, Jerry's uh, work on design protection is right at the beginning of his scholarly career. Uh, he wrote, I think, six articles between 1983 and 1993. And it's kind of interesting, especially given um, the, the real focus of attention um, uh, from all of you um, uh, these two days on Jerry's other work. It's interesting to think about why did Jerry spend time on design? Um, with the other topics that he addresses, 
we can see a, a much tighter connection between his interest in um, distributive justice and access. And so why do, you know, how does design really measure up to these other things? And I just have a hunch, and I haven't asked him, but my guess is that maybe it was initially sparked by his love of all things Italian. Um, <laughs> that that may have brought him into thinking about the problem of design. And having just glanced at the design problem, he would have seen this intractable problem, which would have really sparked his attention. And he would have, uh, he would have immediately saw the opportunity for a scholar only like Jerry to have a historical perspective on the protection and to, of course, have a comparative perspective on the protection. Um, and I think that is um, such, a, such an important piece of this work. And you know, if you haven't looked at it, I, I commend it to you, um, if only for that. Um, you know, uh, the, the, the title that I used for this presentation is taken from a quote from, one of, from actually Jerry's last piece on design in 1993, where he calls it intellectual property, the intellectual property world's um, single most complicated puzzle, um, which, you know, given all that he's addressed is, is an impressive statement for him to make. Um, and I think he, uh, I, I think it is through this comparative analysis that he gets there um, to see those patterns that many of you have mentioned the cycles of overprotection and underprotection, not just in one jurisdiction, but in almost every jurisdiction. Um, this, I, you know, it, you can see why uh, he would have he would have delved into this. Um, and so, it's a great opportunity for him um, to, you know, as I said, bring to bear a comparative analysis, a historical analysis, but also a kind of pan IP analysis, right? To not just look within copyright law, which really was the focus of his work, but to bring to that problem in copyright law an understanding of the other branches of intellectual property law, which I think it's fair to say in the 80s wasn't so much done, right? That, that people were a little bit more siloed. Um, so that's, that's a great uh, contribution as well. Um, and, so, um, and so I think this really does fit in um, with um, uh, the insights that he gained here, perhaps, um, fueled his work um, to see these patterns in other areas as well. So um, the work I'm doing now is dependent on, on Jerry's work. And I mean that in the sense that uh, I couldn't have even thought about this without first consulting all the work, the groundwork that he's done. Um, but also, um, what I'm working on now really directly springs out of uh, what, what, he's, um, what, what he's done. Um, so this is my one slide. Um, I have an interest in um, mid-century modern furniture. Um, and I mean that um, both as a person. Um, this is um, like uh, uh, an addiction. Um, and so these are all, these are amongst the things that I've purchased. Um, and, and I will say, um, this is a business expense because, <laughs> because um, being in the market for this furniture, I have gained insights about that market, um, about um, what fetches value um, about uh, what competition there has been at different points in time, um, about how the marketing has occurred, um, and, you know, and, and what happens with claims of authenticity um, and, and how complicated they are. Um, so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm interested, um, both uh, as, a, as a person and as a scholar in this, um, and um, what, what is so very interesting is that um, today um, there's, a, there's a lot of, not, not scholarly attention, but there's a lot of documentation of a knockoff problem um, for the, these designs and, 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 and their friends today, right? A huge problem in knockoffs, you know, all this stuff coming from China, all this stuff which you can buy online on any website. But this has always been the case. 
Um, so when these designs were uh, developed, when they were first introduced to the market, there was a knockoff problem. Um, there was a, a really large um, market in copies, right? Um, and, you know, for the very same reasons. Uh, these designs were rather pricey and not, and not, not designs within reach, as, as one might say. Um, <laughs> but uh, so, there, you know, so there was an opening, and uh, people took that opening and, and offered um, the same design for less. Um, so that's always been the case. So what, I, what I'm doing is I'm, um, I'm overlaying um, this history of these designs, when they were created, when they were introduced to the market, what the marketing looked like, when um, competitors came on the market, over Jerry's historical story of the ebbs and flows of protection, um, which actually perfectly matches this, right? Mid-century design is said to start in the 1920s and end in the 1970s, and that's actually the same time period that Jerry's looking at in his work. Um, and, and what's interesting or maybe disappointing, depending on if you're a glass half full person, is there's no story to tell. There are no ebbs and flows in this market, right? It, there's no reaction to these ebbs and flows, right? It, it's just, it's just a, a, a well-functioning market, right? So the absence of intellectual property doesn't harm the market. The absence of intellectual property doesn't help the market, right? This is not, I don't have a story to tell here that's the, the piracy paradox story about under protection, fueling innovation, and designers always racing to be ahead of the knockoffs. Um, it's really a story of the law basically being irrelevant, right? Just not having any impact at all. Um, there's still a desire and a demand for the designs. There's still uh, a good price to be fetched for the designs, no matter um, the, the knockoffs. And there doesn't even seem to be a marketing campaign specifically designed to deal with the absence of protection. Um, so so maybe, maybe that's a disappointment, but I actually think it's, it's quite an interesting um, a, a thing to, 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 to consider. I tried to think about the ways the absence of protection or the, the, the kind of the little ebbs and flows in the protection may have been implicated. So um, I have some fiberglass chairs. I have the Eames um, molded plywood. There was a lot of innovation in technique and materials. And so I looked to see whether um, these companies and these designers were trying to take advantage of utility patents, perhaps, and that's why there was such an interest, especially amongst American designers, unlike European uh, mid-century designers in, in these materials. But you know what they came from? They came from World War II. Right? There, there may have been utility patents on these things, but they weren't, they weren't Herman Miller's utility patents. So that was a kind of a false lead. Um, I wondered whether there is, thank you, um, a story to be told, you see a, a bunch of teak, it's all from, it's all from Denmark. Um, so in, in, in Denmark, you see really streamlined designs, not using innovative materials. Um, I, so I looked then to the, you know, the, the design patents that were available um, and thought maybe we would see that there would be some emphasis on some ornamentation. Um, and we can see that in 1950s car designs, but we really don't see that. In, in the kinds of designs that I'm looking at in the United States. So there really isn't, isn't any effect at all. Um, until now, until now. So one of the suggestions in, in Jerry's writing is that um, if only we didn't have a problem of underprotection, we may not have a problem of overprotection, right? If only there was a logical and rational way to address some protection through sui generis rights then we wouldn't destroy the logic of copyright or destroy the logic of trademark, um, and that seems to be one of the drivers. Under protection may be driving over protection. Well, um, now we have very strong design patent rights in the United States, um, massively strong um, uh, design patent rights. Um, we now have um, very strong trade dress rights. Um, so one of the moments in my story is the Sears uh, Stiffel case, right, which is my 
Poland there, right? 1964, Supreme Court says there's no uh, trademark protection um, for this design. There was a de failed design patent protection. Um, that case wasn't overruled. It's just regarded as adorably quaint today, <laughs> um, right? So the law has changed dramatically there. And now we have copyright protection, right, for these, for these, these kinds of designs. Um, and so uh, we have a very different market today. So today is when we see a change. Thank you. One second. Um, today is when we see a change in the um, acquisition of intellectual property. Herman Miller, Knoll, they have a gazillion trademarks on every bit of design. They have a gazillion, a gazillion design patents. They have copyright registrations. They're bringing lawsuits. But they're also marketing it in different ways. So my Noguchi table, if I'd have caught the light right, you would see Noguchi's um, signature etched into the, into the product. So they're even, they're even changing the way the thing is marketed um, and emphasizing those intellectual property rights. So it's a postscript which wouldn't be possible uh, without Jerry's work, um, which I'm certainly grateful for. Thank you. Yeah, I think. Oh, okay. All right. I hope I didn't mess you up with slides. So I, I don't have slides, which means that I can just filibuster up here for uh, my 12 minutes. Uh, actually, though, I will talk um, about yet another area where Jerry has um, shown the way, if you will, um, and that is about overlapping rights in the in a lot of different areas. I will focus on biopharmaceuticals um, and then also extend some of Jerry's um, enlightenment um, into an area that one of the few areas he hasn't written about. I don't think, although I never know with Jerry, um, which is um, was already brought up by Bassem, um, uh, and I'll focus on a specific subset of it, which is machine learning. So uh, let me talk about overlap in those areas. Um, so many of you, and I think um, this is actually on the program, Daniel Gervais was uh, going to talk about overlap between patents and data exclusivity in the area of uh, biopharmaceuticals, and that's a really important overlap. Jerry's done a lot of work on that overlap, um, and it's, it's a very interesting overlap um, that arises because the idea seems to be that patents aren't strong enough for um, molecules, and that we also, for purposes of protecting the investment that goes into the product after the patent has been secured, we need data exclusivity or so the argument goes. Um, so that, I think, is, is a, a challenge because at the end of the day, the data exclusivity um, opportunities are rife for rent-seeking, given that data exclusivity is somewhat sui generis, depending upon um, uh, the regime it's in which it's being used. So um, that is something that I think Jerry has done a great job on. It inspired me to think about overlap um, in the context not of so-called small molecules, where a lot of the work on the overlap between patents and data exclusivity has been done, but in the area of so-called biologics, which um, represent or soon will represent about 50% of the U.S. spending in this area in, of biopharmaceuticals. So think Humira, think Embrel, think all of those fancy new monoclonal antibodies that are supposed to fight cancer. Those things are much more expensive than small molecules. And because of overlap, they really don't go generic. Um, so many of us have spent many years fighting for more generic entry into biopharmaceutical markets, both domestically and internationally. But there, the problem is at least a solvable one in principle. In biologics, because of this overlap that I'm going to talk about, it's really hard to solve, so much so that some of my friends and colleagues from the health world have said, oh, biologics are just natural monopolies, and we'll simply have to um, do price 
uh, controls or price regulation on them. Um, and these are very respected people who are have economic training and the like. And I think that's certainly, the overlap has become so pernicious that one can almost throw up one's hands and say that. Um, I'm not there yet, but let me talk about where the, what the overlap is all about. So biologics are really complex. So the thing that, just to give you a headline version of what I'm trying to um, <laughs> string together in the talk as a whole, complexity creates huge amounts of overlap in the IP system. And so biologics are very complex. Machine learning is very complex, or certain types of machine learning, so deep neural nets, for example. So complexity is the big overarching theme, and then the overlap that's created as a comp consequence of complexity is what I'm trying to puzzle through. So I'll start with biologics. Uh, so we have patents in biologics, just as we have in small molecules, but we also have trade secrecy that overlaps quite substantially with what is patented. So what might be patented is the DNA sequence or the amino acid sequence, but that doesn't tell you anything really about how to make the biologic. And so as a consequence, even when the patents expire, we still have a situation where anyone who wants to come on the market has to figure out how in the world do I reverse engineer this thing? And that can cost hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, because of the complexity. Now, the patents also are a problem because there's evergreening in this space just as there is in other spaces, but the secrecy caused by complexity is just a real challenge that I haven't been figured, I have talked to Jerry quite a bit about this, and we haven't been able to figure out a great way of dealing with it other than, of course, the, you know, kind of the, the deus ex machina of public funding so as to reduce complexity, which of course is a great idea, but um, given you know, the situation in Washington these days, I'm not sure we're gonna get a lot of that public funding. So that's uh, with respect to biologics. Um, the challenge in addition to complexity in both biologics and machine learning is that the product is really the process. And these process details, as Jerry has talked about in a lot of his work can be particularly for really complex products that don't, as he says, wear their knowledge on their face, the process details can be kept secret indefinitely. And so therefore, it's a very uh, difficult to replicate and reverse engineer even if there are no formal patents or copyrights or anything else um, otherwise protecting the, the product. Now, let me talk about machine learning where I see a very similar dynamic occurring. Once again, the product is the process. So for those of you who don't know a lot about machine learning, the most complex machine learning, which is neural nets, convolutional neural nets, deep learning, involves a situation where um, the ultimate product, the trained model, may not be understood even by the inventor. So there are a lot of hidden layers in the net that may not be into so much so actually that the PTO has just put out a request for commentary about how one could possibly claim these trained models if you don't actually understand what they are. Now it I think it should have done that with respect to biologics as well because I think it's a very similar situation. They didn't um, when biologics came on the scene in the early 80s, but so be it. At least they finally figured it out that these are products that are really impossible to claim as products because they are processes at the end of the day. And the only way to replicate them is to know all the details of the process. So in the context of machine learning, particularly the more complex forms of machine learning, you have to know all the details of the training data and then the subset of the training data that is the test data all of the parameters, the hyperparameters, we can go in detail in the Q&A about what all of that means. And you still won't necessarily know what the neural net does, but at least you know how it was made, mostly. Now, there's, there's some talk in the computer science literature about how even if you try to, in very great detail, precisely put down every step of the process, because you wanted the world to know how to replicate. And computer scientists oftentimes are very open and would like to know, have the world know how to replicate their neural net. It's still not necessarily 
fully possible. So that's a huge difficulty. And of course, most of the world isn't made up of publicly oriented computer scientists who love to put their source code out there and their training data out there and all their parameters and their hyperparameters and all the rest of it. Most of the world is made up of for-profit um, and uh, nonprofit types who are very interested in intellectual property, including, of course, universities. So um, in machine learning, there's a little bit of, I don't know whether it's a silver lining or just a problem. So going back to the cycles of overprotection and underprotection, we all know that the US Supreme Court does not necessarily love software patents. So that means that it's going to be challenging to claim the, the trained model as software, perhaps, although the PTO has pushed back, the USPTO has pushed back on the Supreme Court and is allowing a lot of these patents to go through. It doesn't see a Section 101 problem, an eligibility problem. It sees a, and you know, that, that may be at the end of the day um, okay in my book. I'm not sure the Supreme Court cases are the way to go, but um, it sees more of a Section 112, which is the disclosure problem, which I think is huge. But it's not actually enforcing those disclosure requirements. So I've read now many more machine learning patents than I care to admit. And they're very similar to the biologics patents. They don't tell you anything. They say, OK, so I have this trained model that does x. And when you go to the disclosure section, what do you see? Well, a very high level description of some data that might have been gathered somewhere. Um, maybe, oh, and a neural net was involved. But that's about it. So one can imagine that, um, that this is going to be just as difficult a problem as biologic, except for the fact that we won't necessarily have patents that are so strong. They will be easier to invalidate, presumably, on 101 grounds if, if the Supreme Court doesn't reverse course. Um, so I'm torn in this area because I don't love the Supreme Court decisions. I think Alice is sort of incoherent. But on the other hand, it does provide a measure of a backstop against this incredibly, I think, um, pervasive secrecy that is inherent in the most advanced machine learning. And so I don't know what to do about that. And that's my current struggle in terms of my research. I don't think trade secrecy is the optimal regime for any of this, especially for the training data, because as we all know, it's best to pool data if at all possible, and that's even more so in the world of neural nets. So I'm struggling. Um, Jerry is helping me with the struggle. Um, you know, maybe we'll get some sort of regime. You know, public funding is, of course, ideal, but maybe there will be some sort of contract and liability rule regime of the sort we came up with 10 years ago with respect to small molecules. Um, I'm thinking about that right now, but Jerry, um, I hope you will continue to show me the light on this very difficult problem as you've shown me the light on so many problems during my career. Thanks. So good morning. Um, it's a great pleasure and honor to be here. Uh, when I heard about the topic of the conference, meaning Jerry, I was very excited because I knew uh, it doesn't matter what I will talk about because any topic I can come up with, Jerry probably wrote about it, so <laughs> it really didn't matter. Um, so I thought I will use the topic that I was asked to write about for a conference. Um, I would like to echo what Christine uh, said about Jerry. I really appreciate uh, Jerry's contribution to the field. Uh, but for me, as uh, somebody who joined this group a little later, um, to me, the most important perhaps has been the support, personal support uh, of Jerry's. And the fact that he is a very attentive listener. Mm -hmm. um, and it's always uh, a very great thing to have a person in the audience who keeps taking notes and you actually believe it's about your talk. And <laughs> um, I also appreciate the fact that Jerry's work is not only oriented towards international law, but comparative law, which is something that's um, extremely needed. And he not only shows interest in comparative law, uh, but also a great degree of sensitivity to comparative law. 
And I think that's really appreciated also by scholars outside the United States. And of course, that's um, extremely uh, important, uh, particularly today. So thanks uh, also to the organizers for uh, organizing this wonderful, joyful uh, occasion and event. And let me talk uh, briefly about this topic. Again, not my choice of title or topic. I was uh, asked to talk about what happened to uh, software and copyright protection of software since uh, the TRIPS agreement. Of course, the topic is a little difficult. You can figure out how that came about. It's some conference about 25 years of TRIPS, and they thought, oh, software, it should be included. Um, I'm not sure it makes much sense, so I expanded it more to what happened to software and copyright protection of software uh, since the early 1990s, which to me makes a little more sense, perhaps. Um, of course, the TRIPS agreement was not the beginning of the copyright protection for software. Uh, there were a number of countries that extended copyright protection to computer programs before um, uh, the TRIPS agreement. But uh, certainly the TRIPS agreement marks an important point for copyright protection of pro computer programs uh, because with the TRIPS agreement it became the international norm. Uh, but we should not ignore, of course, that uh, three decades had preceded the adoption of the uh, TRIPS agreement, uh, debates about whether copyright and patents uh, are the right types of uh, protections for um, uh, computer programs, or whether some kind of sui generis protection might actually work uh, better. Uh, in the paper, I actually focus on uh, the mutual effects of copyright law and uh, software, uh, but as uh, software as a protectable subject matter, right? So I leave aside in this paper things like what software means in the practice of law. I don't talk about what uh, software means for the management of copyright, for instance, and how blockchain can be used uh, in copyright management. And I also stay away from AIs and computer-generated works and all that. So. Again, uh, very excited about uh, this conference because you know that one of the first footnotes will end up being to Jerry's works. Um, indeed, uh, Jerry's uh, papers in the uh, mid-1990s, 1994, 1995, concerned um, software and uh, patent protection and copyright protection for software. Um, and uh, these Articles are not only historical documents, right? Uh, they are certainly commentaries on the situation as it was in mid-1990s. Isn't it funny to talk about the mid-1990s as if it were some kind of ancient history? Um, but they are also a reminder of uh, all the various pitfalls and problems that copyright and patent law still face uh, as regards to protection of uh, software and computer programs. So in his work and in the work that he co-authored with Pam and others, uh, Jerry pointed out uh, that software uh, protection uh, might be needed, that it is uh, something that uh, we need in order to promote innovation in this area, but that copyright law and patent law are probably not best suited to achieve all the necessary goals uh, that we have uh, for this um, area. Um, and so he pointed out uh, that the real problems troubling the legal protection of new technologies uh, fit imperfectly within the classical patent and copyright molds. Uh, but what was interesting already back then, a number of commentators pointed out, um, particularly those who reacted to the famous manifesto, uh, that maybe we should not underestimate copyright law and patent law. I'm not sure that they were correct about patent law, but certainly in, in the area of uh, copyright, uh, they suggested that copyright law might be flexible enough to adjust and reflect some of the needs of um, software industry in uh, protecting the investment uh, and uh, innovation in this space. So my paper is about the mutual effects, right? My paper is about what happened in copyright and in software since the early 1990s and were the commentators correct? Uh, did we see various adjustments and did it make copyright better suited uh, as a form of protection for computer programs? 
So um, there are certainly many technological changes that occurred in software since the early 1990s. And I hope I won't offend anyone if I focus on only two developments uh, from technological perspective. Uh, the first one I would like to highlight is a wide adoption of object-oriented programming. So when you think about the situation in the early 1990s, uh, most people, certainly lay people, would have thought about programming, computer programming, in terms of procedural programming. So the kind of computer program where you write out all the commands uh, one by one. Um, if you want a robot to take out the trash, you have to tell the robot, just like my husband, get up, go to the kitchen, open the cabinet, take out the bag, right? So that, my husband, right? That's the procedural programming part. Um, Object-oriented programming, which he doesn't apparently know, has been around since mid-1960s, but it really took off at the beginning of the 1990s and became widely adopted uh, at about mid-1990s. And in object-oriented programming, right, that's the ideal husband, where you don't have to say every single command, you just say, take out the trash. And no matter whether you are at home, at your mother-in-law, at your own parents, you know, in a Airbnb or somewhere, right? He knows what to do because take out the trash, he knows. And that's object-oriented programming, right? You don't have to write every single command. You just say, take out the trash, and the robot knows no matter where it is. So the portability part is, of course, also um, highly valued uh, from this perspective. Of course, what uh, was very important for the object-oriented programming development was the introduction of C++ in the mid 19 uh, in 1983, uh, and then, of course, Java, uh, the launch of Java in 1996. Today, there are, of course, other programming languages, but if you look at the list of the most popular programming languages, they are the languages that are used in object-oriented programming. And if you follow uh, the recent and still ongoing dispute between Oracle and Google that concerns Java language, you can see how copyright law struggles to address issues in object-oriented programming. So certainly something that looks very different from what it did in the mid-1990s. The internet. Uh, again, we forget what uh, the internet looked like uh, in 1994. And certainly the wide adoption of the internet uh, meant a lot for computer programming. Note that computer programming was uh, this isolated exercise of individual people. It has always been a collaborative process. But of course, the internet made it possible to collaborate on a wide scale and across international borders. Um, in addition to that, uh, the great spread of the internet actually helped to build uh, facilities and infrastructure that propels many other features that support the development of computer programs. So we would probably not have um, uh, the cloud, um, if you believe that that's a thing, um, separate from anything else. Uh, we would not probably have the Internet of Things, right? We would not have uh, computer software present in our everyday lives to the extent that it is today. And that certainly means also a lot for um, software development. So let's move to some of the mutual effects. And again, I am just selecting few examples from the paper uh, in the interest of time. So certainly a lot has happened uh, to copyright law in response to software. When you think about uh, things such as initial copyright ownership rules, particularly, for instance, in the European Union, right, the original EC directive actually creating something like a work made for hire sort of doctrine in Europe, right? Uh, making sure that transactions in software are easier. Uh, think about uh, the scope of protection, right? And again, Google versus Oracle, um, the, C, uh, the Court of Justice of the European Union's case in Bezpečnostní Softwareová Alliance. I enjoy the fact that I'm the only person in the room who can actually pronounce that. Um, SA and Institute, right, and other cases. Certainly we see effects of software in uh, copyright law in terms of how copyright law had to address interoperability of software and other specific features. Uh, 
The example of the opposite, right, something that hasn't been written about in the mid-1990s, maybe because it was sort of understood that that would happen anyway, uh, but maybe because we could not imagine this, software also influenced copyright law in the sense that there were certain imports from our, uh, copyright, from software into copyright law. And here, open source and public licenses are a wonderful example. Now, some people, when they think open source and public licenses, they think that that was actually copyright law influencing software. But I would argue that's not the case because open source really started um, in uh, the 1980s and not necessarily because of copyright law protections, but because of trade secrets protection. And from that developed the idea that uh, we should have access to source code Therefore, the source code should be open, meaning not free, right, but accessible. Um, and that, of course, created then all the movement around public licenses, starting with uh, the GNU GPL license, and then, um, of course, Creative Commons and others. So that's an interesting move from software to computer, to copyright law, and an interesting uh, effect uh, that it had. And in, I, in my paper, I go through some uh, additional examples. So uh, to sum up, uh, I think that we, the papers from 1994 and 1995, the manifesto, are still extremely relevant. They were perhaps very ambitious and uh, perhaps uh, had no chance um, in, uh, at that time and probably not, will not be reflected in practice anytime soon but they certainly highlighted a lot of the problems that we continue to see in uh, the use of the classic IP doctrines to software. Thank you very much. Thank you all so much. Uh, we have, uh, I'm going to beg borrow or steal five minutes from the rest of the, the agenda, which gives us about 15 minutes to talk together. Jerry, would you like to begin or end the, the discussion today? <laughs> All right, so we'll come, to, we'll come to you last. So here are mics. Let me hand out a few. And maybe we will collect a couple of questions then we can discuss. Gustavo, why don't you start? You're on. Uh, I would like to ask you to comment on the relationship between in, in, in the production of, of uh, um, copyright, possibly copyrightable works of art or inventions through artificial intelligence. Uh, uh, the relationship between entitlement and liability. Because, um, for instance, in the case of the Rembrandt, Rembrandt is dead, but if uh, the algorithm had been instructed to create a, a work a la Oldenburg, or, mm. uh, would that have been a derivative work? that had uh, requested, uh, would, uh, would request the authorization of the, I don't know if the Waldenburg is living or dead, but still his heirs should be there. And the same in, for inventions, practical uh, things, in the perspective of Internet of Things, uh, if the invention produces damages to, to things or persons, what would be the, the, the right solution to apply? I, I think in, in, uh, in Roman law there was the old, uh, the old um, principle where gains their pains. So a sort of uh, ubi commoda, ibi et incomoda. But it's also a principle applied in the product liability objective responsibility. So I would like to comment, maybe adding a station on that metro. <laughs> so brilliant. And one more, and then we will we will take answers. Okay, so I've uh, I've got a question for Artie. So, um, isn't perhaps the 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 follow-on question when it comes to patent protection for neural nets about the scope of that protection? Because 
So, and there I think we have difference to biologics, right? So if you get a patent on the biological drug and plus the sort of perhaps uh, natural monopoly which may exist in both fields, the scope of that protection for neural nets probably is different, right? I mean, there may be a question, if it's really a process, what is the product directly resulting from it, which we may or may not have to protect actually under TRIPS even? Mm -hmm. And what does that to, to markets? So I don't know if you've worked on that as well, perhaps? Sure. So, um, Basim, I think the Gustavo's question comes first to you and then perhaps to other members of the panel. Perfect. I will be brief to uh, your question, but I will complicate it a little bit because there is certain initiatives that uh, came up the past few months, projects studying uh, the best-selling movies or best-selling musics in the past few years, or the movies who win the, the awards, uh, let's say Cannes Festival, and they started to analyze that and uh, to train the uh, machines to write a scenario and to write a scenario for a best, the coming best movie. So in this case, what will be, how we are going to classify this work, whether it will fit under the, the right of works or no, uh, there is a lot of elements uh, that are included here. How we are going to, how the courts are going to apply that, I don't know uh, the answer. Uh, to your point on the invention, I was surprised to see a little bit different logic because within the patent law, we accepted long time ago that an inventor will uh, submit an application for the patent office uh, over an invention that mainly 99% is based on the software and it has been written in a way to say that this is the inventor. Now what we are facing that we are in, in a phase, so, and we accepted that for several years. Now we started to discuss whether the patent office will accept an AI machine uh, as an inventor and whether we are going to use the name, uh, we continue to use the name of the person uh, submitting the application as the inventor uh, over that. There is a lot of pushback for the moment and a lot of companies they started to think we need a specific uh, rights for the machines mm -hmm. to the point that you have correctly raised the damages to avoid being sued for damages so that was i was reading reading trying to figure out why they figure out this point why they are pushing it has been the trend for years to got the benefits of the patent. Why they want to separate now between the machine that they have been used for several years and the uh, companies or the, uh, the applicant for the invention. So there is a tension for the moment. Again, I do not have answer for this point, but I am hoping I will be able to build some potential solution for that. Darty. So just on the tort liability issue, I think tort liability is driving a huge percentage, at least in the patent space that I'm more familiar with, um, of, of this debate. Uh, because uh, the hope has always been that we can push liability off to the user of the software. Um, and um, with this, it's not entirely clear one can. And so um, I focus a lot on the medical software space where they're extremely concerned about this and and um, and I think that's driving some of these inventorship decisions as well um, on on your question yeah I think it's a really interesting question it seems to me that so I've talked to some uh, lawyers who do patent drafting for um, machine learning and they think and you know this is sort of against interest that the better claims are to the process they think that's the way to claim appropriately. Um, but inventors apparently don't want that. They want claims to the trained model that performs a function, which is a much broader claim, as you might imagine. And, and I think a claim that doesn't necessarily, I mean, I guess it gives some notice, but it's 
because it's the function, but it doesn't, you don't know what the train model is, so it doesn't give a lot of notice, and it's certainly also very broad. So, um, I, 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 and I think it looks like right now, at least the USPTO is letting those, those patent applications go through both on 101 grounds and 112 grounds, I think they're quite problematic. And, um, you know, whether they'd ever hold up in court, of course, is another question. But uh, I, the only thing that I find um, to be a little bit of a, I find a little bit of solace in, in is that the PTO kind of knows this is an issue, at least in the 112 context. And so it's asked about what, what it means really to um, comply with written description and enablement in the context of claiming a model. Um, so thank you very much to all of you uh, for uh, a very interesting um, review um, of what started. You know, I think all of us um, can go back to Jerry's as being the very first one uh, conceptualizing this idea of hybrid, then today's more commonly called overlapping rights. Um, and I want to look back to what Christina said about the need for, do we, I think sometimes we have today, certainly a market that is completely different. Um, we, depending the country where we are, but in general, the tendency is the more, the merrier we have. Um, we see abolishment of all sorts of channeling rules. Now we have on the same items, we have the design, patent or industrial design. We have the trade dress or shape trademarks or all sorts of non-traditional trademarks. Then on top of it, we have copyright. And then we have unfair competition or passing off, depending where we are. Um, and we see these strings pull depending on the contest, which one is more. Um, and particularly up front, we see lawyers getting them all and then courts trying to demolish them, but courts being very hesitant about Reputting channeling. So the court maneuver in trademark world about is not distinctive, or um, they, they try to identify whether there is harm or not, but then they really go with very strange theories that goes down on a case by case. Sometimes they work on the common law, much more difficult than the civil law. Um, does the panel see in this world of overlapping rights, going back to what Jerry was saying partially, um, some light over. I'm very, I'm, I'm very interesting personally because I'm doing a lot of work on that. Uh, we have been doing a lot of work on that. And sometimes I tend to be very negative about overlapping rights. Um, but sometimes some of the exceptional limitation of one area get pulled in the other area. For example, in copyright, uh, the fair use uh, and freedom of expression expre um, the limitation got pulled, you know, in that honestly, had tip to Josh Kozinski in the United States into the trademark world. So Barbie has become a freedom of expression item in, you know, in the Ninth Circuit. And, and, and so is that all bad or can we try to leverage this world where everything goes to try to find more exceptional limitation? Because I think now it's very difficult to create channeling rules. They're going to be against international treaties, they're going to be against law, and so it's very difficult. Uh, judges can figure out a case by case, but can we try to do more to import not just the pluses, but the minuses from one right to the other? And so what, what do you think could be on a more balanced way? So this is a, a, a toss-up question. Who wants to start? Well, let me just say a word. Um, I know it's not a um, Again, I would commend you to Jerry's writing about this because um, you know he has um, he has explained how you can see in some of the district court decisions that the just the instinct and the desire to push back, and how you can trace the kind of lines of argument in those Southern District of New York cases to you know how the courts were pushing back in Belgium, you know, in the very same way. And he even refers to it as a patent approach in a copyright case. So exactly what, what you're talking about in terms of taking, um, just kind of bringing to bear some of the ideas to just provide some logic of limitation. And, 
you know, the story's not over, right? I think it will continue and maybe we're just in one of these peaks of overprotection and that's what we'll see. Um, I think the place maybe to look will be in the district court decisions and copyright now following Star Athletica to see if there's, you know, if there's some room to push back. Um, I, I think it's, a, again, this happened long after Jerry's last article in design uh, protection, but it's the unity of art approach precisely, you know, um, that, you know, from, from the French approach. So uh, it, it's, it's just fascinating. So, I, so it's, uh, it's an optimistic note and maybe. Okay. Thank you. Um, well, it's a very interesting question, um, and uh, I wonder whether we should be so skeptical about sui generis protection um, after the TRIPS agreement and other international treaties, because um, as many people have suggested, uh, it seems like we have made uh, so many accommodation to certain types of protectable subject matter in copyright and software that if you just you know, change the perspective a little bit, maybe you would, you could identify sui generis copyright uh, protection for software, right? I mean, you could define it with all the different um, adjustments and all, all that. So um, I, I don't think that I would be that skeptical. Um, Jerry, in his 1999, 1995 article, uh, pointed out that the French, for instance, when they expanded copyright protection to software, uh, from the beginning, right? They looked at it as a different type of protectable subject matter and de facto started creating a sui generis type of protection within the umbrella of uh, copyright while fulfilling uh, the letter of the treaty. And in addition to that, I think when one would think about describing this sui generis law, for instance, for software, um, but even for other protectable subject matter and even in patents, I think one would have to be very careful not to stick only to the letter of the law, right? And not only to um, the statute and the case law, but go deeper, right? Go to local rules, for instance, of uh, federal courts, go to practices, uh, go to the examination practices within the patent office. And I think we could end up describing what would end up being actually a sui generis law for certain protectable subject matters. Just, no, Jerry, a, a last question or comment? Well, uh, I, I was particularly struck by uh, the, the, the microphone. Oh, I'm sorry. I was particularly struck by uh, by the references to no, the, like the manifesto. Okay, uh, uh, because um, the manifesto uh, was one of my favorite articles, but for for a different reason. It was. What it was, was a product of an incredible learning process. Uh, Pam and I sat across from the table uh, from uh, two really illustrious people, uh, Mitchell Capor, who was the inventor of Lotus 1, 2, 3, and uh, Randy Davis, who was really one of the great figures. In it. And all we could do was talk to each other about this problem and teach each other. Well, we would say one thing, and they would say, well, but look, and then, and then that was, oh, but then, and it just went on. It was a continuing dialogue of try, and every time we think we have something, somebody else would say, yeah, but what about this? And then we'd have to explain what that was in copyright law, and then they'd have to explain what the, what, what the, uh, the, the, the corresponding element was in, in software. And it was absolutely wonderful. And I think that it's what you're all doing, what we're all doing now is a continuing process of that. Uh, uh, just that we all know a lot more about it than we knew that we knew then, although every once in a while we get some dumb decision like uh, uh, Alice Corp that doesn't quite know where it's going or what it wants to do. But uh, the problem with Alice Corp is that it really wanted to do the, the, the the European approach, and it didn't understand it, and it didn't, <laughs> it, it, it didn't know that it was what it wanted. To do, but, leave, but, 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 but leave, but leave that. What my point is that 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 article was nothing more than a, a result of a of an ongoing uh, uh, integrative discussion between people from two different uh, disciplines, and I think that's what's happening all over the world in this area. It has to just keep on. It's a uh, we are learning as we go because we don't have a priori solutions that work, but we keep getting uh, tests and experiments that do sometimes work. And so we have to, uh, I am also, I thought, 
you're pointing out, I think the courts handled a lot of software problems better than I would have expected mm -hmm. that they, they, they could have done it, which is why, as I say, that when, uh, when the Federal Circuit suddenly <laughs> moves into copyright law, uh, I nearly exploded, okay, because I, I think one of the <laughs> dumbest decisions I, have, I ever read about it in a period in which we have ever-increasing intelligent decisions yes. about what's going on. So I think the process of, of learning that we had there is, was really what's going on everywhere, and, and I hope it continues, and thank you for your wonderful contribution to that process. <laughs> A grand note. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.